Thank you for the very kind invitation. Um, I'm here to, um, to tell you, to bring sort of an insight into what is happening, what I see when I'm travelling the world, and what I'm particularly seeing in world uh, food tourism. Uh, I'm like all media. I'm here to pose questions, really, than come up with answers. And um, the big thing I'll be saying today is where does our province and our island rate in food tur tourism? And the answer, sadly, is rare, scarcely at all, very, very low in the priorities. Um, I will be asking questions rather than posing the answers, but we will tackle uh, a couple of suggestions as to how we go about not good in food, uh, better in drink, but probably not as good as we should be. Why is this? You, know, you see George Orwell uh, is there behind me. And uh, we have a problem if anyone, uh, if the animals of Ireland have read George Orwell. We are seriously outnumbered, guys. Um, the Irish ingredients and Northern Ireland ingredients um, for in specific uh, areas have been exported all over the world for hundreds of years. And we've seen the great chefs of Italy and France using Irish ingredients to build up a, a reputation for cuisine and uh, culinary, a reputation as a culinary destination. Sadly, we haven't been able to exploit our own ingredients to achieve the same thing ourselves. What do I do? I travel. Um, there's about 50 or 60 of us who travel with the intensity that I do around the world. We go from event to event, tourist board to tourist board. Our job is to read the trends, speed, and that's me in the bar, bar on the A380. I don't know if anyone has flown uh, Emirates uh, A380 from Sydney to Dubai, but they have this magnificent semicircular bar upstairs for business class travellers. That's the sort of thing I do for a living. I, um, what, I, we, what I will be looking at uh, this year in terms of what's happening in Europe, I'm going to give you a little bit of an insight into Europe and then in Ireland, and then we'll go into the meat of the matter, uh, pardon the pun, uh, which is food tourism. The forecast, the UN WTO forecast, is for 4% growth in Europe this year. I think that's a bit low. Uh, I think we could actually see quite a good surge of inbound tourism into Europe, particularly parts of Europe which are not seen as risky. And that has been happening already. Um, we have gone outbound travel uh, out of Ireland and travel in general for, uh, from the big markets. Germany is the biggest outbound market in the world, have been rushing back to Spain and Portugal. Uh, Turkey's tourism collapsed last year. It collapsed to about 60% of previous levels. And we could see a situation, France was very flat. I was out in France last week at the French Rendezvous event. Their figures went for 2016, likely up from 83 million. Spain is hanging around 80 million. So big uh, news, breaking news would be that very likely Spain will overtake France as the world's leading destination this year, which is uh, that France has been there for the last 25 years. Other things that are happening, because uh, oil prices haven't spiked up again, we've seen quite an explosion in uh, air routes. That's been very good to Belfast, it's been very good for most of European countries, and what really grows um, is in, inbound tourism into a country is not your big trunk routes into London, Heathrow, Frankfurt, Charles de Gaulle, uh, Schiphol, it's the point-to-point -point stuff. Uh, the stuff that's going into the smaller cities, and we're seeing an explosion of those sort of routes. What's been happening in Ireland? Um, we've had really good growth, uh, 9, 10%. We now have 10.5 million uh, tourists to the island of Ireland last year. Uh, it's been growing at close to double figures in the last four or five years. Everybody uh, that I know is saying that's going to drop. Different people come up with different uh, uh, predictions. One of them, uh, the Irish Tourism Indo Con Industry Confederation, say 4%. Uh, Tourism Ireland say 1%. Why? Um, the word that pro uh, everybody is just fed up of hearing, Brexit. We're not exactly going, uh, sure what's going to happen. We lost a million uh, British inbound tourists in the recession. We haven't really got them back, and it's unlikely that they will be travelling in numbers again. Uh, so that's what it is. Ro strong growth from North America, by the way. We'll have 27 flights a day 
to North America and from North America during the course of the summer. That's going to be a drive and a huge growth out of Canada, very relevant to Northern Ireland because of the cultural connections with Canada. And uh, what we see with Norwegian bringing the transatlantic flights to Belfast is really significant, but not as significant in numbers as you might expect, because that's only 7% of the overall capacity. But what we will also see in Ireland is Dublin under serious pressure. The bed spaces aren't there. They're going to get a net gain of about 30 beds uh, this year. So uh, very, very hard to uh, get beds in Dublin, and that is going to disperse uh, passengers out of Dublin, which tends to be the first stop and the last stop before the flight home. Uh, so that could be good news for Belfast as well, which is undergoing a bit of a building boom. Um, Stirling can be an advantage for the north. It's really a, a good to be in a Stirling zone right now. That's very good from the point of view of the dollar uh, to Stirling, um, it, it, and it could bring North American tourists in uh, uh, their itineraries being more concentrated in the north than has been the case until now. And re remember, you're growing your beds. Uh, there's shortages, not just in uh, Dublin. Galway's in trouble. Uh, Killarney less so, but he, he, all of them uh, are seeing price spikes, which is really upsetting some of the very big inbound tour operators, the Abbeys and the CIE Tour Internationals, people like that. Two great signature attractions that's really important for the North Giants. Causeway does nearly 800,000 a year. I haven't seen Titanic's figures for 2016 yet. It's around 600,000. That what that does, what you need is a cluster of about four or five of those 400, 300,000 uh, attractions. And uh, that's where, that's the big revolution has been, uh, the way that the Titanic has grown the, the attraction side of the business here. These are the hotels that are on their way up. It's really good news. Are there too many? I see a bit of discussion about that. No is the answer. We've, uh, you can never have too many beds. Two things that will drive tourism are access. Most important is access. Nothing happens without access. But if you have the beds, uh, you will actually get, you would fill them. That's been the experience all over Europe. Um, there was a little bit of whining during the recession that we should be closing down beds. Absolutely not. Build them, sell them, compete on rates. The rates will, 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 will be trashed around by the, particularly the online travel agencies a bit, but that's very little to do with, uh, with, what, uh, with the, the fact that there's an oversupply of beds. That's actually loads of other different market forces at work. And you can see here very clearly why um, Belfast is really important as an access point as well. When you put together uh, Belfast International, Belfast City, and what everybody forgets, the port of Belfast, it's bringing 1.4 million people a year. Um, when you put the, all of those together, you've got um, more than 25% more than, uh, of the access to the island. Uh, people would have remember Graeme uh, Kettle there uh, from Belfast International uh, having a little pop at uh, Brian, uh, who is the chair of Tourism Ireland. He was the <laughs> Belfast City uh, manager, and he said Tourism Ireland isn't doing enough to promote Belfast as an access point. I think um, the, the, the overcapacity in Dublin and the pressure on Dublin will do its own business in terms of that, and it's good to see the transatlantic routes arriving to Belfast. This I'm a little bit sceptical about. Um, food tourism has become uh, part of everyone's portfolio. It's almost like tourist boards around the world have been told, if you don't have food tourism in, find some reason to put it in. That means that when you go to a major event, you'll have 200 countries all telling you how great their food is. Um, I think food is one of those things that you fill out in a survey where um, you know, people used to put shopping. Why do I go to New York? I go shopping. It's a combination of loads and loads of reasons, and tourists always have to eat. So if you up your tour, food tourism offering even a little bit, uh, people will, it, will, it will be overemphasized in the figures. But what has been fascinating to see, and people, some people recognise Alistair McLeod there, he was uh, wheeled out by Tourism Australia, he's from County Antrim. And he's based in Brisbane. But he was wheeled out by Tourism Australia to show how great Australian food is. Australian food, uh, in my memory, was, regard was deprecated. It was regarded as another prawn and the Barbie sort of stuff. And uh, it, it has become a big uh, battering ram to get Australia's name out there as a tourist destination. Tourism Australia invested colossal amounts of money, funds that uh, Northern Tourism NI would dream of, to promote their, their chefs and their produce. And it's a, it's a roadmap, really, for what we could be doing here. 
And the traditional places, the places that we would always associate with great food, have been very slow to react. Um, you know, Alentejo in Portugal is, is the breadbasket of, of Portugal. It's quite interesting that they didn't put marketing into how great their food is in the way that uh, places that has worse food have and have been sort of left trotting behind. So the lesson out of that for us is, if your product isn't great, you can actually push yourself out as a food destination. And when you have the ingredients that I alluded to in the very first point I made, we have the best ingredients in the world here because of our climate, what, what can go wrong if we start, um, we start pushing it out? Um, this uh, is Jessica Prentice. She invented this word, locavore. It was the word of the year 2007. No, people won't... Uh, rem it hasn't been used. It, doesn't, it didn't go into currency in the way that other words of the year have done the year. Very American concept. Very interesting for us. Um, the, the, concept, the definition, and it's a rolling definition, is that if, you're if your food is coming from less than 100 kilometres away, it's fresh and it's good, and that's what you should be doing, feed, pushing up out your local stuff. The, re, the joy of this is we don't have to do the marketing on this. This is something that caught the imagination of the world. It became a really trendy word for about uh, five or six years. But there hasn't been any <coughs> worldwide progress on this because, what, as usual, when, something, when you see a consumer trend, the big guys got in on the act. And there isn't a supermarket in Ireland that doesn't have a picture of a farmer. Uh, beside his vegetable patch now, and it's to you know it gives you the impression that the farmer is arriving uh, daily with his vegetables at the door of the supermarket. The supermarkets uh, and the food supply chains are working in exactly the same way, but we we've been sold this story that everything is being produced locally, local and fresh. Um, I mean, if I interview another chef and he tells me he uses local fresh produce again, I'll, somebody is going to have to say, so you've stopped taking it out of the tin. Uh, what, what, what does fresh and local mean? Everybody is coming out with the same message. Everyone is, is, is uh, it's almost a mantra that um, the, the whole, that every restaurateur in the world has, this, has um, repeated this to the extent that you wonder how meaningful it can be. The kitchen gardens, you see, this is the Fairmont uh, in, uh, in uh, Minneapolis, I think, and it's got its a garden on the roof. And I remember uh, a, a meal in Washington, D.C., where we were get served honey from the uh, bees that were kept on the roof. I mean, it was a tiny bit. There was a joke about the guy who went to Ballymoney and he was given such a small amount of honey on his, his toast. He said, uh, so I, keep you, I see you keep a bee. Uh, there was a little bit of that, that how much, how much when you're sitting down uh, 130, 140 covers uh, twice a night, uh, how much can come from your herb garden? There's absolutely no doubt there's a lot of eyewash going on here. And these are the ego guys. Uh, you know, I just love these, you know, the celebrity chefs, I used to call them leverage chefs because they'd use their TV status and then, you know, get it, try and get to monetize it and then it became a sell equity chefs, you know, you've got um, people who open chains of restaurants. Uh, I remember many years ago, a bit of a shock that Alan, Alan Dukas uh, opened a second restaurant with his Michelin star, uh, effectively a chain, having bought um, uh, Joel Robichon's restaurant. And Robichon was saying, how can you have two restaurants when you're a Michelin star chef? You have to be in. Alan's answer would be, I don't cook everybody's uh, dinner every night. But what we have now, and Robichon followed the trend, is uh, get the name, get the TV programme, and answer, open, open up chains. And that, to a large extent, has cheapened the authenticity of the, um, the food experience. And if you're looking for the cheapening of authenticity, these guys have budgets to beat the band. Uh, you're sitting down 5,400 passengers for dinner on Oasis or Allure of the Seas. Now, there's a clatter of these new ships coming. Meraviglia from MSC is coming. Carnival of Art at four. They're all in that sp space. 5,400 uh, passengers plus 2,000. Uh, plus 2,000 staff. That's a town, I think, the size of uh, Carrickfergus or somewhere like that, floating around the Caribbean. And the food, interestingly enough, isn't, isn't sourced locally. Um, the food is shipped in containers from America. So even if you're cruising out of Genoa, uh, the, ship, the food arrives in craters in, 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 because they buy it in bulk. 
And this food has travelled across the Atlantic to be served as genuine Italian food to guests who were sitting on the cruise ship in Italy. Uh, fish is sourced locally. The interesting, uh, the, uh, an, uh, interesting uh, uh, development of that eyewash is that you're brought by the chef out to the, lo the, to the local market and some of the Caribbean cruises where he buys a couple of cabbages or whatever fruit it is, and then he comes back to, eat, uh, to feed 5,400 passengers with them. <laughs> And this, uh, what do you do when you're in the air? Your kitchen is four hours flight away. Uh, these are the, the Lufthansa guys, but Turkish have a flying chef as well. He comes out in the chef's uniform and he takes the order and he goes back into the same uh, little compartment, you know, to the, and yeah, you get the picture. Okay, all of this is eyewash. This is to our immense advantage. Um, the year of food and drink was a success. It was proclaimed a success uh, at that dinner in January in the Ulster Museum, um, which had no politicians. Very interestingly enough, they, they, uh, they, there was no politicians at the night, so it was very much a tourism NI event. But um, what the message that came very, very clearly from that night is the big achievement of the year in food and drink was not really in uh, placing Northern Ireland in the world food map, which it, you know, did, it went a step towards, but in convincing its own inhabitants that our food is worthwhile because there was a, a sense of deprecating your own food, that the French did food, the Italians did food, the Thai-end restaurants in, in London did food. And uh, while we, you know, there's a couple of us competing with that, uh, it wasn't that great. So what, we, what has been achieved is really step one for that investment, and that is to persuade the local population. If the taxi drivers believe Northern Ireland food is great, everything will, will uh, everybody else will. Uh, start agreeing. And uh, that's it. We work the market. Once you've got that uh, upswing and the pendulum is swinging in that direction, we're starting to believe in our food. A lot of work by the Hastings group here and great chefs like Ross McNeil and uh, Michael Dean and Danny uh, Barry, who also, you know, here we go, just instanced Australia. She did her training in Australia. She, they're using Northern Ireland chefs to promote their, how great Australian food is. We should be doing it ourselves here back at home. It's great to see Danny uh, for the first Mich female Michelin star uh, chef uh, in many years in Ireland. And then uh, just keep working the, the market. Um, you know, persuade, persuade, persuade. The message has to be simple, has to be clear, and you have to keep repeating it, like all messages. Sorry about the pun. Uh, the stakes are high. Uh, it's a crowded market. Um, that's the pictures from ITV Berlin. You have 27 halls of tourists, all pushing out their tourist product, and they're all saying uh, our food is great. Uh, we have a little bit of that action, but we're very, very, it's not that our food is inferior. We just have to get, uh, to, to get our message very clear on focus. And we've got very, very well-funded opposition out there. And we've cross-marketing uh, funding. Department of Agriculture tend to have more voice in countries and are taken more seriously by the Minister for Finance uh, in countries than the Tourism Minister. So get the Department of Agriculture funding behind it. Um, this is a menu where you're charged 38 uh, euro for an omelet. Uh, people will, are will willing to pay a premium. Uh, Mary instanced it, uh, the people who are prepared to pay for something that uh, is free, they will actually pay more if they're absolutely certain and if they're convinced this is a premium product and it's something that uh, they cannot get unless they actually fly to Ireland and eat here and do it. But uh, eggs are eggs as far as I'm concerned. Um, I mean, how do, you, how do you charge 38 euro for an omelette? But they were queuing up uh, last week in Mont Saint-Michel for their, for their omelettes out of this wood-fired kitchen, taking photographs, taking selfies, all of that stuff. Um, it's going to be a, a, a four or five year investment. That's the, um, the gathering to celebrate the year of food and drink. It was declared a success, but it's really um, the amuse-bouche. It's not the, 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 the start of, and what I would strongly advise is look around at the Australias and at these guys. Um, but what Noma and Geranium uh, have done in Copenhagen, uh, and we have, uh, for the first time, at, at Michelin Star in the Faroes. Has anyone been to the Faroes? Uh, they can only grow one thing there, rhubarb. And uh, they now have a Michelin Star restaurant. Now, the, in Scandinavian food, where I came, grew up, was basically rotting fish and meatballs. So what they've done to reinvent Scandinavian food 
using the power of media, using the power of those, li those meaningless lists, restaurant magazine, it's almost all Western European lists, but Noma finished top of that, El Bolo, all of those uh, restaurants usually are in it as well. But, and uh, to, what they've done to, what you can do by working those lists and getting yourself, positioning yourself, is convince people uh, you're up there with the best. We should be up there with the best because we're ingredients. We have to do that. Flaws in the system, the supply system is broken. It's really hard to get direct food from a farmer in Ireland. If you're a small restaurateur, if you've got a bit of uh, time in your hands, a bit of buying power, you, it's a little bit easier. Uh, regulation, we've got tons of it over the last 30 years. It always suits the big guys. And you end up with um, the food being gathered into central sources and dispersed around the country. Uh, Doreen Allen told me once if the uh, Palace Foods van broke down, the restaurants of Ireland would come to a halt. Um, there is a big problem with desserts, uh, even sourcing fish. I mean, uh, going down to the pier to get fish is, is a bit of a drama, or has been a bit of a drama, straight because the fishermen, it's taken off them and straight away to a central holding point and uh, everything. All the desserts are coming out of a box. I see a little bit of movement um, pastry chefs in some of the high-end hotels, but we have a long, long way to go. Uh, how do the customers behave? They all see different things. You're not going to get a message from the customer saying, this is food tourism, this is what I want to eat. They're going to be confused by mixed messages. You've got to um, get where, what each client wants uh, work it out uh, very, very easily. The trends are very easily read uh, nowadays. We had a whole talk on them earlier. But what I would strongly advise is set out uh, a clear message and make the choice for them. Bring them to Northern Ireland to see to, to a particular food, to expect a particular standard of food and a particular type of food and particular locations associated with food. Rate yielding, big story for another day. Um, the airlines are the ones who did this. The, uh, Michael O'Leary and Kenny Jacobs, they're laughing there. Why are they laughing? 120 million passengers and 1.5 billion profit. They did this by putting people uh, sitting on the same plane, one of them charging 300 euro and this person beside them charging, uh, paying 20. Now, rate yielding for restaurants is the future. Uh, we could actually end up uh, with the same sort of uh, pricing strategy being used to fill downtime in restaurants and to fill off peak periods in restaurants. Uh, it's been a little, hotels have been rate yielding, trying to work it. Oddly enough, the same passengers who were happy to deal with Michael O'Leary are slower to deal with hotels and are slower to accept the rate yielding models. But my, I, my strong feeling is uh, the Groupons, people like that who are doing deals, they will just start doing the rate yielding model, bring the rate yielding model to restaurants that airlines are using, and I think that's uh, gonna, going to happen. This uh, is just you know, regionalise, make sure that, you know, if you're going into a particular, uh, have a strategy uh, that when you go into a particular region, there are options, there are four or five restaurant options, uh, use things like uh, lo traditional local dish dishes, which wouldn't be well known internationally, uh, would you, should you have a Dulsk trail, things like that, it's all there. And um, the final message really is, leave any visitor to Ireland and to Northern Ireland in particular, in no doubt what we do best. What we do best is all in the kitchen. We've got the best ingredients in the world. And everywhere uh, we should be promoting, we should be uh, um, planning the, the landscape almost, uh, 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 accentuating the landscape, not planning the landscape, but accentuating the, the landscapes uh, in our uh, uh, social media and in our, our proclamations and in our, our uh, advertising that everywhere you travel you cannot escape the fact that this is a food producing country, huge food producing country. It's time for us to use our ingredients to an advantage because everyone else is already doing it. Thank you very, very much.